Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Happy Project Podcast. My name is Becky. Sitting across from the table to me. Sitting across the table to me. From me? Sitting across from, from me on the table. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. This is getting off to um, a great start. Cedric Skysetti is over here. Yes, I am. Hi, and welcome. Hello. Thank you for the welcome. You're welcome. Today, we're going to be talking about something we have not delved in yet. No. It may feel kind of random, Maybe. but yeah, to, to many, but to some not people, to some. Yeah, 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 but it does make sense in the grand scheme of really what we talk about on this channel. Sure. We are talking about mixed cultures here, and this topic is definitely, uh, I would say, some sort of blend, the East meets the West in a unique way. Mm. Definitely. But uh, we are going to be talking about the Catholic Church in South Korea. I guess we could just say in Korea because it was established before the war. Right. So Catholicism in Korea and how did it get here? Yeah. We're well, going to talk about that. Yeah, I think it's going to be an interesting one. I certainly learned a lot, uh, you know, being one who uh, I, I would consider myself someone who knows a fair amount about Christianity, mm -hmm. uh, more specifically Protestant Christianity. Yeah. But Catholicism is something that I'm not as familiar with when you come to like trying to dive deep into it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, yeah, I just, uh, we learned a lot. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and how it relates to uh, just Korea and how it got to where it is today. Yeah, it's an interesting story. And by the way, if I keep saying Catholicism, you tell me, okay? Because it, it just rolls off the tongue. Yeah, and I don't know if I've never heard anyone say Catholicism. <laughs> I mean, maybe that is a correct way to pronounce it, but I'm I've always heard it as sure Catholicism. It's not Catholicism. <laughs> I don't know. I just look at it. It's oh, Catholicism. It's Catholicism. You know, it just looks like it should be pronounced sure. that way. Anyway, you tell me, okay? Because I realized a second after I'd said it that I said it wrong. That's all right. Just um, give you guys a heads up. Now, before we started, I thought we would play a little game. Oh, okay. As we know, many famous films have been made about either nuns or monks. And uh, I happened to find three that were all musicals. So I thought we could sing a little bit of the song and you can guess which movie <laughs> it's from. Okay. Okay. So Let's he go. Here's the first one. <clears throat> How do you solve a problem like Maria? How do you catch a cloud and pin it down? No, you don't know that song? Okay, this this no is idea. another song from the movie, very famous. Mm -hmm. Edelweiss, Edelweiss, every morning you greet me. Wow. I have no clue. Okay. All right, how about this one? Raindrops on roses and whiskers on kittens. Oh, I, I've heard that. Okay, do you know it's from? Um, no. Because the next sound of sound of music. There you go. Really? Ding ding ding. Yeah, because I was gonna say the hills are alive oh, with wow. the sound of music. That was kind of a guess, but I think it was like uh, I subconsciously knew that. You got it because it was Julie yeah. Andrews. That's why. Mm. Sound of music. Okay, right. Julie Andrews played the nun Maria. Here's the next movie. Ready? Joyful, joyful, Lord, we adore <laughs> thee. Do you know that's from? I do, but I want you to keep going. Oh, okay. Well, I forgot, actually. How, what's the next line? Uh, God of glory, Lord yeah. of love. Yeah, it's Sister Act. Yeah. Sister Act 2, specifically. <gasps> wow, Cooks. Mm. Yeah, Sister Act 2 was my favorite out of the... I, I think I, they had only I think two. they had better music. Yeah. Well, it the was, first was one was, Oh, happy day. No, I think that was a second that was in, movie. Yeah, that was oh, in part two. Oh, happy day. Then what was in the first one? I don't remember, because to me, I remember as a kid, it was always very boring for mm, me. I liked both of so them. So I don't remember anything. Yes, Sister Act was another famous film based on the premise of Two for two so far. Okay, and then here's the last one. Oh, gosh. Okay, I'm trying to... Okay, there's a lot of songs from this one. <clears throat> 
Look down, look down, don't look him in the eye. That feels like um, was it a was it a movie with Hugh Jackman? One day more. Hugh Jackman, right? Yes, another day, another destiny. Was it the? You know this movie because you watched with me. Right, that was they were. It was like that ship sing. Scene, okay, that right? was in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, There's man. a pivotal What's the name of the... pivotal character. In oh, this uh, one. Uh, uh, ma- uh, not Mamma Mia. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Lame is Lame is Lame Les Miserable, right? Yeah. So I knew this... it was like a Broadway. Exactly. One, yeah. So Lame is Rable is very um, has the, the the significant character, the bishop. Mm. who turns That's Jean right. Valjean's life around. That's right. Hey, you know, we could just make a podcast singing songs from musicals. Yeah. Wouldn't that be fun? And just have me guess. And you just guess. <laughs> you would not be able to guess almost anything. Of but course. you were lucky with these three because they're just so famous. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I think the first one was more of a guess, but I low-key probably knew it subconsciously. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Sister Act 2, I definitely know. Absolutely. Well, well done. Three for three. So Catholicism has given us, I did it again. Catholicism. Catholicism has given us lots of fodder for wonderful movies. Mm-hmm. And it would make sense because Catholicism has been around for a very long time. It has. It is what? The oldest institution in the Western world. That's right. I, I read somewhere even it's been around for like 2,000 years. Right. Yeah. yeah, so I would say shortly after the uh, the death of Christ. Mm. Well, Catholicism. Catholicism? Catholicism. I'm so sorry. Catholicism was originally part of this whole, the whole Christian sect. Sure. And then it happened to be schisms and schisms and schisms and schisms that broke it apart, which is now why we have a separation between the different types of churches. Right. Right. But Catholicism, yes, is the oldest institution in the Western world. And uh, I imagine you can't really have a head count that's exact, but this is about a billion, more than a billion Catholics worldwide. Right. Yeah. Which is, a hu- I mean, given that what, we have about 8 billion people in it's the world? quite a roughly? lot of people. Yeah, that's a lot of people. Who consider themselves Catholics. And another interesting fact is uh, the, the Vatican City, has diplomatic relations with almost every country in the world, including South Korea. Mm. Yes, it does. Yeah. So some things that uh, Catholics believe, some of the basic beliefs, would be, I suppose, probably the most significant defining factor from Christianity is the belief in the Pope as the successor of Peter. Right. The first head of Christ's church. Right. Yeah. Yeah, uh, because Peter is thought to have been the really the first person who started the church. He's credited with that. It's because of that Bible verse: "On you I will build this rock," or "On you are the rock on which I will build the church." Right. Right. Which, yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what Jesus told Peter. Mm-hmm. And then in the Book of Acts, at least in the uh, the canon of scripture that I'm used to reading, yeah, uh, yeah. So it, the church started with Peter in Acts chapter two, and so. The Pope is sort of just in that line of succession yes. and authority. Yes. Right. So the Pope has a, I mean, you can call it power. Um, others would call it sort of this divine authority Mm-mm-mm. that he can, he's really the final say in terms of representing, um, I guess, Christ, representing yeah. God. Yeah. And... Uh, You know, I actually read somewhere because I had to do a little bit more digging into like exactly what they believe, but uh, he can speak infallibly on matters of faith and morals, Mm, 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 mm. but oftentimes he doesn't do that because again, the Pope is the man. He is a man. He's a human being, which means he is flawed Mm -hmm. by nature. So I think there is a fine line that they're very cautious with, like whoever's holding that position at the time. But in theory, uh, he can speak on those matters of faith infallibly. Yeah. Yeah. So um, pretty big seat to fill. <laughs> it is. Yeah. And a pretty big hat to fill, too. I mean, yeah. you've, you've seen their hats. I've seen it. It's pretty dope. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. uh, it is interesting to think that one man who hails almost always from the Western world, mm-hmm. right, and has always been white. Yeah, to my knowledge. Yes. Has such say and power and sway over people from all over the world right all different countries all different cultural backgrounds and yet this one religion can have a lot of weight in whatever the pope is saying 
Right. And this is something I was just thinking, like, wow, what if it's in direct, you know, direct opposition to some countries' culture or traditions? Mm -hmm. Then what do Catholics in that country do? But it was just something I was thinking about. Right. Well, we're definitely going to find that out from the perspective of Korea. In Korea, yes. Yeah. I mean, but there are, you know, a couple of things just to mention. They, uh, Catholicism, that is, uh, the they do share the belief with Protestant Christianity that Jesus Christ is divine, the Son of God, mm. and he came to earth as a man to redeem mankind mm. uh, through his death and resurrection and to redeem mankind from sin. Uh, and I think where the divide sort of happens is uh, on the Catholicism side, there is a little bit more of a devotion to the Mother Mary, yeah. who is uh, believed to have been the virgin, um, I guess, the virgin mother mm -hmm. Of Mary, virgin. I yeah. should clear not virgin. Not but. there's only one version. Yeah, <laughs> right. just one. Right, and uh, yeah. So uh, she is. She has a special place in heaven mm -hmm. where she serves as an intercessor between God and man, right, and mankind. Uh, I think more specifically to believers of the faith. Yes. Yeah, I and, think so. Yeah, and I mean, among that, I mean, a lot of people know Catholics as meeting for mass. They go to these big you know, churches or cathedrals mm -hmm. and they meet together. Uh, it, we call it, you know, in Protestantism, church service, essentially. Mm -hmm. But it's like mass mm -hmm. for Catholics. Yeah. And, you know, they have many different rituals and traditions that they sure. follow within the church. And this is not, you know, by any means a podcast about what they do and no. how they do it. It's more so uh, just the implications of what Catholicism brought specifically to Korea. Yeah. Yeah. Very fair point. Yes, another big thing that still plays uh, a major role in Korea today is uh, the Catholic Church's condemnation of abortions. Mm -hmm. So you can see in Korea that still abortions are kind of, well, we don't talk about that. That's not allowed. And I have to wonder if the church had any role to play in that um, still to today. And then also Catholics do believe the Bible is error-free inspired word of God. So that's kind of the, the basic beliefs of Catholicism. Super basic. There's, it's impossible to, to generalize it in right. such a short amount of time. Yeah. But uh, yeah, just to kind of throw a couple of things out there. Yes. So people kind of understand, all right, this is what comes to Korea eventually. So quick stats then before we hop, hop over to South Korea. Uh, according to BBC 2013 article that came out, Estimated 1.2 billion Roman Catholics in the world, so quite a big number. And Asia represents about 12% of the total Catholic population. And most of that percentage is in the Philippines. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely most of it. <laughs> yeah, Philippines. <laughs> Philippines is very strongly Catholic country. Right. I think it's the only uh, country openly where they say Catholicism is, is our country religion right. in Asia. Yeah, definitely. I think it is the only country. Uh, they actually, they have a pretty big population of 100 million people, mm. and about 85% of them do claim Catholicism mm -hmm. as their main religion. Yeah, and I heard this is a reason why Christmas in Philippines is so great. Ooh. <laughs> Yet to experience that. Other than that, the percentages in Asia will be found primarily in India, China, Japan, Vietnam, and South Korea. Right. Which brings us to... South Korea. <laughs> so according to South Korea's Catholic Pastoral Institute, church membership in the country rose almost 50% from 1999 to 2018. And even though that number has dropped off precipitously, apparently uh, the Catholic Church still holds a rather um, popular standing among the common people, just how ordinarily what we think of Catholic Church. Right. And there's a reason for that. And that all goes into the history. Most definitely. And this is where it gets really interesting. And I think you and I, we have the tremendous job today of explaining <laughs> the context of oh, not only yeah. how Catholicism came into Korea, but also trying to describe the context of the time of Korea society up mm. to that point. Mm -mm -mm. Right. Yeah. So I guess we go back to what? So 200 and... Should we start? Sure. 18th century? Yeah. You want to go back in time then? Yeah. Okay, you press the button on okay. the time machine. Here we go. Oh, oh wow. <laughs> Going back to 18th century, oh my gosh. Yeah. Wow. 
well, oh, where are we? It looks the same. It's actually. so good to be here in the 18th century. Just yeah. always dreamed of this. So more specifically, this is well over 200 years ago. Yes. And let's explain a little bit about the context of Korea at the time. How about that? Okay, that's a good idea. Um, well, at the time, it was the Joseon Dynasty. Hmm. And the Joseon Dynasty was strongly founded on the Confucius ideals. So Confucianism. <laughs> Confucianism. Confucianism. <laughs> Confucianism. Oh, Right, so I think everyone listening will have a you fun understand. time today. With, Confucianism, yeah. <laughs> it was uh, it 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 dictated a very strict society. Right, right, and actually, what I found, and I don't have the timetables for this, mm-hmm. is I believe at the beginning of the Joseon Dynasty, which mm. started in 1392, mm. I think that's the agreed upon date in time. Uh, Korea was actually more of a Buddhist Mm-mm-mm. nation. And I think at a certain point within the five centuries that the Joseon dynasty lasted, it switched over to a Confucianism state. Okay, Confucianist that's state. fair, right? Because yeah. it is neo-Confucius right. is the term that was often used. So about the time when uh, Catholicism did enter Korea, it was the late Joseon dynasty. And they were the Confucianist society. There was a loyalty to the king. This was mm, emphasized yeah. strongly, loyalty to the king. Ancestral rights which still are practiced today, and a very strict social class system. Also, at this time, only the elites could read. This is very significant for uh, the way Catholicism entered into Korea. And um, while Korea was a very closed-off country to other, other countries, so they weren't really embracing technology or philosophies or science from the outside world. So this was kind of Korea at that time, in a nutshell. Uh, However, there were some young scholars, primarily, and remember this is a very elite thing, this is how it started among the elites first, young inquisitive minds who wanted to know, well, wait a minute, we're hearing all this philosophy, or how does the earth go around the sun? How, How do we build this kind of weaponry? They were more curious. and But however, the, the high culture of thought at the time was, oh, those things are trivial. It's unworthy. Mm. We are into an intellectual pursuit. So, of course, where were these young, curious people, men, of course, where were they trying to find their information? Primarily through Western writings right. that they could get their hands on. Right. And the interesting thing is that actually trickled through China. Mm-hmm. So China had a huge part to play in the influence of Western thought and philosophy and even the progress of, I guess, technology mm-hmm. uh, with Korea because that's how it trickled through. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, so at the time, as you mentioned, you know, you had the elite, the what we would consider like the Yangban. And mm-hmm. we mentioned this uh Many episodes ago, mm-hmm. we were talking about the this. more aristocratic society. Right. And the Yangban class, you know, these were the military and the government official servants that pretty much had control and influence over every aspect of society. You yeah. had them, and of course you had the king, the, king, the mm-hmm. empire. Uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, I guess the king. Yeah. Yeah, for lack of way better... <laughs> <laughs> Boy, we were we're just wow. <laughs> we're just great with words today. Yeah, we had the king, uh-huh. we had the young bond class, yes. and then you had pretty much everyone else. Mm. You know, and everyone else illiterate, uneducated, yeah. uh, living in rural, poor, rigid areas. place in society that you yeah. couldn't go higher. No, Once you're in that position. You're in that position. Yeah, because you have babies. Your baby's going to be in that position. Yeah. You grow up to be in that position. Yeah. So this is that sort of context uh, at the time. But the young bun, mm. they were able to read, and they were the ones that were getting the, uh, I guess, the books and the mm-hmm. materials from China and the Western thought. Yeah. And these were the guys that were able to read it. Now, the thing is, you had the young bun class, but you also had, like, you had different, I guess, age groups in the class. You mm. had the older ones that were more experienced. And they're, it's, I mean, it's funny how history repeats itself, because they're the ones, imagine politicians who yeah. are, like, the old school politicians yeah. who... They do things the way they've always done it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And they they don't really progress with society. Yeah. You know, you had the older class of young bond that were like that, the elites. And then you had the younger guys that were more pragmatic mm-hmm. and uh, more progressive in their thinking. Mm-hmm. And so these guys, 
you know, they're, yeah, I mean, they share the same ideology generally, but it's like, okay, why do we do it that way? You know, we're hearing stuff from China. They're, they're like, you know, progressing a little bit in mm -hmm. this. Why don't we look into that? Yeah. But the older guys are like, nah, we're cool, you know, because we just want to debate about stupid stuff and abstract <laughs> stuff. Because that's, apparently that's what they did. They uh -huh. just like, yeah, they just had all these arguments and debates amongst each other of, you know, about things that don't really move the society forward. That's they, a fair point. And I think the young guys were just like, oh, I think there's a little bit more right. to life. Because their eyes were kind of being opened. And this is not to say that people who were only in Korea, their eyes were closed. No. But as in they were getting influences and hearing this from the outside, primarily, you're right, through the writings that were coming through China because Korea was heavily influenced by China, but they were closed off to the outside world otherwise. So the amazing thing about Catholicism entering into Korea was it was purely academic curiosity right. because this was all under the umbrella of sohak sohak which meant western studies basically western ideas which was um it was a combination of technology philosophy and religion so it wasn't necessarily oh we want a new religion right. and the other thing that's important to note korea is the only country that pretty much proselytized themselves they didn't have some outside Western missionary come to Korea and say, this is the way and you have to believe it. Really, it was just academic curiosity. They got their hands on these books. The religion was just part of it. Right. And it caught on. And pretty much Korea built up themselves to be Catholic. Mm -hmm. well, not the whole country, but Catholicism grew in Korea primarily out of that, not from outside Western influences. Right. So I think it was a big part in just the the cur curious mind mm -hmm. of the elites who came across this material. And it's just like I, I could imagine that as they're studying and reading and processing through it, that they begin to really, I, I would imagine that their minds just expanded because yeah. all they've known up to that point was just how they did it in their society, yeah. in Korean society at the time. And after seeing just more of what's out there in the progress and the technology, including the religious thought mm -hmm. and the philosophies of that, I think they realized it, it was almost like to them, I could imagine it was undeniable that there was something more or maybe another better way of looking at life. Right. And a different lens to look at life through. So I think that's what happened. So it wasn't like a forced thing. Uh, it wasn't like, oh yeah, we, you know, this, we need to just totally overhaul mm -hmm. our government. Mm -hmm. But it was just, a, I think it was a gradual, man, this is like, yeah. this is probably a little bit better. Or we at least want to, you know. Pursue this. We want to learn right. more about this. Right. It's, it's very, very interesting that it wasn't pushed onto them. But it was really just kind of homegrown. Mm -hmm. um, and there are two major characters, I think, who helped kick this off in Korea. So there was a young scholar named Lee Byuk. And he was a young intellectual, the Chosen Dynasty. And he came across some of these writings that had come in through China. And it was perfect timing because he had been trying to find other schools of thoughts outside of Confucianism, Neo-Confucianism. And he was thinking, it's just too narrow. He wanted to learn other things. So he was meeting with other scholars who also were a bit of the dissidents, I guess you could say, the young rebels <laughs> of the scholarly groups who also wanted to learn more about these Western teachings. And among those scholars, he met Yi Seung Hun, who was uh, the first son of a very well-known Confucius scholar. Mm -hmm. So this is Ooh. something. And he, he shared with him, hey, I came across this thing called Catholicism. And so Lee Byuk greatly influenced Lee Seung Hun. They really you know, chatted it up, and apparently they had their meetings with other scholars, and it grew and grew and grew like that. But uh, so Lee Seung Hun decided to go to China with his father on a sort of, I guess it was a government mission, yeah, like a diplomatic type Yeah, of trip. I, I imagine something like that. But he went there and he visited a Catholic church that was, they were growing. There were missions coming into China. There were missionaries to China. And he was baptized in China. So he came to Korea and he brought with him as much as he could. Books, crosses, rosaries, holy cards, and uh, decided to share this. And so, again, it was more of the pursuit of academics and curiosity and what is this? And and uh, then he baptized Lee Byuk. And this is the thing I found very interesting. Every single time in Korea, when we're mentioning these major Catholic... Dang, Catholic. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the easiest one to pronounce. Right. Catholic figures, they adopt a Christian name, quote-unquote Christian name, and they're always Western. Mm, right. Did you notice that? I didn't... Yeah, I noticed that. I didn't know the reasoning behind it. I... 
I don't know why either, but mm -hmm. it just seems, I don't know. I just thought it was very unusual. And if you think about the names, I think they are actually biblical names. Yes. Yeah, Andrew, John. But the thing is in, I guess they call themselves like Johan, which would have been the Korean version of John. Mm -hmm. So for example, Lee Byuk, uh, gave he was given the name of Johan or John after John the Baptist and Lee Seung-hoon took on the name Peter. Right. So these are the names that they would, I guess, call themselves mm -hmm. amongst each other, which, again, I, I found that to be very interesting. So together, those two really started to just talk with other scholars and share Catholicism with those around them, and it grew pretty rapidly. Right. And one thing I want to throw in there and mention is during this time, we're talking now the 1780s, mm -hmm. where we're probably starting to add just a couple of hundred people, well into maybe just a couple of thousand mm -hmm. by the end of the 1700s. Yeah. And one thing I actually want to mention is uh, this, when you think about the significance of what was happening at the time, we're talking the mid 1780s when the scholars were really getting influenced and actually dedicated their lives to Catholicism at this point. Right. Think about Korean society. We have a top down society where the king is the top dog mm -hmm. and then you have the elites and then you have the bottom, which is everyone else. So you have this separation of class, but in Catholicism, the sig significant part, especially during this time, is the fact that through the Catholic philosophy and the biblical philosophy, guess who is the king? Mm. Not the emperor at the time. Yeah. It's God. Yeah. You know, and uh, not only that, but everyone else is pretty much level. Yeah. You could, there's a, a concept of equality right. that existed. Right. And the significant thing is with the early Catholics, you can just imagine just a room full of people from both classes, essentially, the young ban mm -hmm. who dedicated their life uh, and everyone else, just all in the, the same room, yeah. worshiping together, praying together. And this is something that was absolutely unheard of at the time yeah, and not even welcomed in right, Korean right. thought. So this is why this is so significant and so, how can I say? Upending. Yeah. It, it turned the, the concept of what society should look like upside down. Right for a lot of people that was very attractive because in the the system the society that existed there was no moving up you were what you were is what you were some people live very difficult lives and this the teachings that they were getting from the catholic church or the catholic catholic teachings whew, <laughs> i'm having a rough time those gave them a sense of uh, individual power and also mm. individual i guess meaning right right so it was it was very significant it did shake up the society and that is what led to the 1800s early 1800s the persecution yeah so uh, many many people were killed and considered martyrs for the sake of spreading catholicism because of course the religion clashed with these ideals of the society and it threatened the hierarchical system and so they they fought quite a lot for I guess it was religious freedom, but in a way, again, in Korea, for me, it's almost like freedom of thought as opposed to religious freedom. And it just happened to be the religion that they fought for. I, I still haven't found quite, when was that crossover from, mm -hmm. whoa, look at this Western way of thinking into this is a religion that we dedicate our lives to. Right. That's a, that's a very good point because uh, I'm not quite sure if it was more just the fact that the religion brought an open mind to equality mm. and the the realization that we are all the same and we are all uh, equal mm -hmm. and, and God is the head uh, versus is it really that I'm so dedicated to this religion that I'm willing to die? Like, I don't know where the balance is. Shame, and maybe yeah. for different people, it meant different things. But I think ultimately it was more just the, you know, equality and this is the better way of looking at life and looking at people mm -hmm. you know this is this is the the i don't know i think it brings a different perspective to human value because in the neo-confucianist society human value is basically what your position is and mm -hmm. that's it you know yeah. and i think with this religion the korean people at the time really thought well Let's reevaluate this idea of what it means to be valuable as a human being. And mm -hmm. so maybe this is what they were fighting for and dying for. Right. And um, that kind of cemented its position, 
I would say, in Korean history. Because, you know, if you think about the Catholic Church in Korea, it's pretty much broken down into three parts. You've got the beginning where it was this acceptance phase. Well, guys, let's talk about this. Well, cool, cool, cool. And then the persecution phase, Mm -hmm. which then it kind of, it made it have this weight to it. Oh, we died for this cause. Then it had a kind of weight. And uh, it did seem to you can read also carried into families, right? So, oh, my father was martyred in this time. I will carry the mantle and also be a good Catholic. So it kind of carried on like that. And then into the third phase, which was after they were granted amnesty by King Gojong in uh, 1895. This was when finally there was a goodwill meeting between the archbishop and the king. And this is pretty much the ending of the persecution. Mm -hmm. And so the church is now autonomous. It wasn't a mission spot. It grew, it was indigenous in a weird way, even though it's it's a Western um, doctrine, right? right? And so, but again, you know, over throughout all these years, there were priests being invited to Korea to, so they could learn more about the doctrine, as if getting a lecturer to come over. Hi, we'd like to invite you <laughs> to speak here. But right. uh, it's very fascinating because I, I can see, according to um, some of the articles I read, Korea is the only country that ever did it that way where it wasn't a missions group coming here. I mean, if you think about in the Philippines, of course, uh, a lot of that would be the influence of the Spaniards. Mm-hmm. But there was no colonization happening that brought a new religion. It just purely grew out of the interest from the people. Right. That's that's quite phenomenal, I yeah. think. Um, yeah, so you you had all this persecution, which I think gives a different sort of value to the followers mm-hmm. of the religion because... The thing is, if you know the history of the decades of persecution with the people like your father or family member or friends or, mm-hmm. you know, people that you know that have died for the faith, that makes the, your faith even more meaningful. To, and it's yeah. like you don't want that to happen in vain. So you're going to commit to it even more. Mm-hmm. And the the thing that happened with the Catholic Church is throughout the periods of persecution, it actually grew. Yeah. Yeah, so you had a couple of probably up to twenty some thousand uh, by I want to say eighteen sixties because it was uh, the last major persecution was in eighteen sixty six, mm. and at that point the religion grew to about twenty three thousand. And I don't know how many people actually lived in Korea at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, but you got to think this is pretty significant because it goes t- totally against the grain of society at the time. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, that's how Catholicism pretty much has persisted mm-hmm. that throughout the time. That was the, the time, first yeah. seed. But uh, Catholicism, let's, let's, now let's separate it, okay? Because we have, from the beginning, the philosophy, let's call it the philosophy or thought, the school of thought, Catholicism, now being established as an actual church, okay? We have the... Catholic Church. Mm. It is now an organization. It exists. It's a thing. Okay? And they have played a rather significant role in the democratization of South Korea, which I found to be very interesting because we always have this talk of the separation of church and state. Mm-hmm. But it seems almost that the Catholic Church as, a, as an entity in Korea was not so separated. There's a difference from the Japanese colonization time and then after the war. Mm -hmm. You can see a change in mindset. Yet it's interesting how after the Korean War, where Lee Seung-man, you know, the first president of the democracy, Mm -hmm. quote-unquote democracy, (laughs) in South Korea, after the separation of North and South, he he was administration known for Mm, I'll be very careful. I don't want to. I don't want to say anything. But he he did have some dictator like qualities to him, and so the people were a little unhappy. Mm-hmm. And the Catholic Church was pretty open about criticizing that. There was a uh, a daily newspaper that was Catholic run called the Kyongyang Shinmun, and um, basically it was criticizing him in the news. Every single day. Right. So people were like, whoa, okay, what's going on here? And um, then the prime minister, who was a devout Catholic, he resigned from office and became anti-dictatorial movement. So he was part of the democracy movement. 
And at that time, then Isengman started to consider, okay, the Catholic Church is my enemy. Mm -hmm. So here we can now see there's some clashing happening between church and state. Right. And I know that, uh, again, I want to be careful too, but Isengman was not shy in, you know, punishing uh, Mm. those that opposed the ideology at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that, I don't know, I think to me that gives even more of, I don't know if validation is the right word, but the Catholic Church really had to stand their ground. Yes. During that time. Yeah. And uh, the fact that they remained vocal mm-hmm. um, speaks volumes, you know, because at that point they're fighting for what they believe and they're, they're fighting also not just, I don't think it was just for, and Re- this is, yeah. Nothing religious minded. It, it, right. it seemed almost to be more for the people. Exactly. Exactly. Right. Um, and I'm sure the religious part had a part to play, of course. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And... This, I think, carried on for just a few decades. It really you know? did. So the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, um, where Korea was still in that uh, mi- military dictatorship mm-hmm. style democracy. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, um, and from my understanding, there were a lot of people who were activists mm-hmm. and who fought against this sort of um, quote unquote regime. Exactly. And the Catholic Church provided a, a sort of a safe haven for them, mm-hmm. for the activists and those that were participating actively. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, I could imagine that the Catholic Church was providing homes and just a place to stay and to, you know, to sort of get recharged, to go back out in the battlefield, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, and so I think the the church was given a, a pretty, I, I guess, credited for that. Yes. As well. Yeah. To get a little bit more into detail of this, so the the church, the Catholic Church, and mind you, we're going to mention the Catholic Church because, of course, we mm-hmm. have the Protestant movement that's also growing at this time. But the Catholic Church had a lot of social confidence and popularity among the people, and that is specifically because they were so outspoken against these dicto- dictator-like regimes, democracies that were happening in in South Korea at the time, and um, this, I think, it, it goes hand in hand when we see. At Myeongdong Cathedral, do you know Myeongdong Cathedral? Have you been there? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, it definitely stands out. <laughs> it really stands out. Right. It's the only I guess Gothic style mm-hmm. cathedral, the first Gothic style cathedral uh, built in Korea, and it's right in Myeongdong. It feels almost like it feels almost out of place. It does among all these yeah. glitzy buildings and high rises and, and all then, the shopping and stuff, and then you have the cathedral. Yeah, the one lonely cathedral right mm-hmm. there. Have you been inside? I have not. I've only walked... I remember, actually, my mom was with me, and we walked around. We were trying to find some, somewhere to eat, mm-hmm. and we ate around there. But that's my only, actually, memory of being close to the cathedral. Yeah. Um, it's easily overlooked, I'd say. And um, I think a lot of times people will see old cathedrals and be like, oh, what a stodgy old place. But Myeongdong Cathedral is really, really significant. And I remember it was a couple of years back, before I knew any of this, a couple of years back, I actually went inside the cathedral because I was feeling just really lost. And so I remember I went inside and I just sat in the pews and I was just just feeling the air. <laughs> and I don't know what it was, but I left and I felt oh, just so much better. Then I was doing my research and I was like, whoa, this is kind of crazy. Mm-hmm. Okay. So Myeongdong Cathedral, it opened a long time ago, 1898, but it was known as the center of Korean Catholicism. And it was the forefront of the democratization movement in Korea during the 70s and the 80s. Oh, okay. So we already knew what was happening in the 50s with Lee man They were talking and all of that. And then the 60s, this is the moment, I would say, a turning point for the Catholic Church. 1969, Stephen King... Ki- <laughs> Stephen King. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, my gosh. His name is Kim wrong Soo-hwan. Activist. Yeah, wrong activist. Kim Soo-hwan, and his uh, baptismal name was Stephen. So, again, mm-hmm. taking on the... Western name. So Stephen Kim Suhan was appointed as a cardinal by Pope Paul VI. He was the first Catholic cardinal from East Asia. So this was quite significant. Mm -hmm. Oh, who is this guy? Great. And um, he was really loved by the people. And he was very, he was at the forefront um, of, of the democracy movement, strangely enough. I don't think people usually associate the church with democracy, right? Right. I mean, at least I never did. 
for the right. Catholic Church. Not, not in like an official capacity. Right. Yeah. But they were at the forefront and it was Myeongdong Cathedral where things really clashed right there. So what happened was, uh, again, in the 60s, 70s and 80s. So we have, who is it now? Park Chung-hee. Mm -hmm. Park Chung-hee, he was, um, it was a military rule basically. And there was a lot of industrialization happening. So Cardinal Kim Soo Han was, was really open about social issues and saying, we need to take care of the labor class, the labor workers who are suffering under this regime. And um, so he, he was a, a very prominent spiritual figure and promoted democracy, and he would challenge openly the government. And uh, you could see his leadership was kind of a focal point. People really gathered under him. And then it was on, uh, it was in 1987 in June, where students then gathered outside of Myeongdong Cathedral. Mm -hmm to protest the regime. And apparently everyone was watching. And by everyone, I mean everyone, because I found a New York Times article from that date talking about what was happening. And so this is the quote that I pulled from the article. It says, the students had marched on the downtown area to lend support to some 400 hardcore militants who continued to barricade themselves inside the Myeongdong Cathedral, the center of South Korean Roman Catholicism. If the government tries to wait out the students, they give an impression of weakness an unacceptable loss of face in this country. But if they storm the cathedral, they risk a breach with church leaders who consider the students to have sanctuary. So the priests uh, and the church, Myeongdong Cathedral, and by the way, if you guys look up photos of this, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. There's just thousands yeah. of people out there. And the dem demonstrations went on for a very long time. I'm on like three weeks or something. Um, this was the, the democracy movement. This was a turning point. And the Catholic church, not only did they show themselves to be at the front of that, they offered sanctuary to the people who were going against the government. And they had so much right. sway and authority, the government couldn't do anything about it. Right. It's funny because it's like a game of chess mm. between the government and the people, uh, specifically the Catholic Church. And it's almost like trying to plot out the next move. Yeah. Because you don't want to, you know, make the wrong move and then mess up or, you know. So during this time, which, you know, at that time, so this is 1987 mm -hmm. when this happened, right? When that happened. Yeah. So this was pretty much the same year where this military dictatorship rule mm -hmm. regime ended mm -hmm. as well. So the Catholic Church is credited with a big part in that. Yeah, fighting on the side of democracy, yeah. which naturally made the Catholic Church very popular and still to today maintains a fairly good image sure. of that. And then in 2014, and I know we're probably going to bring it up, when the Pope visited Korea yeah. then... Uh, this is Pope Francis. I know him. <laughs> so he's the one that beatified the 124 martyrs uh, who died in the 18th and 19th centuries for the faith. And so there were two different beatifications. <laughs> you know, I, I want to say it's beatified because it's the beat it be. beatitudes. You know what? That, <laughs> that probably is that. I was just we, thinking that. So you know, beatified sounds a little violent. <laughs> we, <laughs> so uh, for those of you guys listening, sorry, we will uh, work on pronunciations for the next episodes. Oh, Whenever there are words yeah. that we're like, we don't know. <laughs> but uh, the point is, um, during these times is mm. when uh, these martyrs and these They're brave... recognized. Yeah, these brave people of the faith were recognized yeah. by the Catholic Church as a whole. Not just in Korea, but as a whole. right. Yeah, Korea is not just some offshoot out there. It's embraced by the Vatican. And like you just said, uh, and then, oh, well, it was in 1984, after the Gwangju uprising, which was another big democratic movement, he came to visit Korea, Pope John Paul II. There and so go. I feel like that's, in a way, it's almost like a stamp of approval. Mm -hmm. I'm not speaking for the Pope, but I feel like it's almost a stamp of approval, like, sure. Korea, we see you, we see what you're doing, and the church supports you guys fighting right. for democracy. Right. And I think it was that trip by Pope John Paul II, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where he beatified <laughs> uh, the 103. I really hope that that's time, right. <laughs> I believe. So uh, don't quote me on it, but I believe that is uh, one of the purposes of his trip in, in 1984. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, Korea. I don't think people initially think, oh, Korea's a Catholic country. But it, it has had some significant moments due to the Catholic Church. So, uh, today, what is the Catholic Church doing today? Well, um, I guess I didn't really want to look overall, what's the Catholic Church doing today? But I, I just pulled out a couple of things that, um, I, I suppose, interested me. With the Catholic Church's history, uh, you can still see 
that the Catholic priests and nuns and people who are part of the Catholic Church are still pretty outspoken when asking for equality or caring for people of, quote-unquote, the lower classes. Just in December of 2020, there were thousands of Catholic priests and nuns who marched through Seoul demanding reform in South Korea's prosecution system. And the prosecution system in South Korea does hold a lot of power. And we know when someone holds a lot of power that goes unchecked, bad things can happen. But um, they were, they've been marching for this reformation to happen. Who knows if it will make some change, but I believe that the Catholic Church, I mean, still has quite some weight here with what they have to say. So it'll be interesting to see what comes of that. And it's kind of cool to know that the church in Korea, or the Catholic Church in Korea, at least in more modern history, didn't keep their hands off of things. It would have been very easy to say, oh, we're not, we're not involved mm-hmm. with this kind of stuff. But uh, they kind of jumped in, into the fray. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I think that was, that was definitely brave mm-hmm. of the church in general, but also specific members of the church to do that. Because who knows where Korea would be without the Catholic Church in the beginning yeah. and also in recent times, in recent history. And we have to remember that it was together with these Catholic teachings that, quote unquote, Westernization, Western thought and philosophies and technologies were entering into Korea. Mm-hmm. So right. perhaps if it hadn't been for such a keen interest in this religion, maybe Korea would not have developed as rapidly as it had at the op- onset. Right. So um, the final, I guess... There was one last thing I wanted to touch on. I was trying to figure out if the Catholic Church had been active after the Korean War with taking care of orphans, mixed kids. You know, did the Catholic Church have a big part to play in that? The only thing I'm aware of is Father Keen. He had an arch... I guess he he was a, a, a priest from the States, I believe. And he came to Korea after the war... And this is, he was just preaching to the people. And that's when he noticed in the back of his, his uh, small church building, I suppose, at that time, all these orphans kids coming in. And he thought at first they were American kids. And because uh, I read some articles on him and he was like, oh, man, why, why are all the Americans coming to my, my service? I'm here for the <laughs> Korean people. But right. then he realized that these were children who were mixed. And he also recognized at that time that many of them didn't have a home or being very mistreated. So he started to bring attention, let's say in the Western media, to those orphans in Korea, the mixed kid orphans. And so um, he had a role to play with the passing of the Amoration Act Mm -hmm. um, up in Capitol Hill in the United States. And we're going to touch on this a little bit later. Again, I'm going off the top of my head from some articles that I read quite some time ago. So if some of my facts are a little bit garbled, look into that yourself. But... um, Father Keen, I do know, played a significant role in that. But otherwise, the Catholic Church as an entity itself, I couldn't really find anything that they did. I feel like um, a lot of the orphanages that were established for the mixed kids after the war were primarily by uh, Christian or Protestant groups. Right. So correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe um, you have direct experience with that or you know more on the catholic church and how they helped with mixed kids after the war uh or the 70s and 80s you can let us know i'd be very interested in that but i think that was my last fact Ah, very good way to end the well i actually had one more fact (laughs) okay (laughs) but it's not related to korea at all okay well uh this was a fact i found about the catholic church you know the term hocus pocus Mm, yeah. Which um, people never think is Catholic. I think it's like witchcraft or something. Right. Well, apparently the word hocus pocus comes from a Catholic ritual, the consecration of the bread as the body of Christ. When the priest speaks the word, this is my body, in Latin it is hoc est enim corpus mem. Hocus pocus. <laughs> oh, really? The transformation of the, the bread into the body. Uh-huh. Hocus pocus. Wow, that's that's cool. It's unexpected. That's very unexpected. Maybe it's true, maybe it's not, but I cast a spell on you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, of course. You can always rely on me to find pointless facts. And that's all I have on Catholicism in Korea. 
Do you have anything else you'd like to add? No, I think uh, I think we covered. We, we, we did a nice little blanket sweep. Yeah, there's a whole lot more, of, of course. course. And it's yeah. pretty well documented, too, mm -hmm. if you want to look into the rise of the Catholic Church in Korea. Yeah. But um, we recommend that you do. We'd be very interested. Interested to hear from people who have experience with the Catholic Church in Korea, or um, if you're aware of anything that they did after the war. And um, yeah, that's all I have to say. That's so it. make sure you listen to our podcast, subscribe anywhere you get your podcasts, and you can of course watch this on the YouTube channel as well. If you are, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment below, and you can always get in touch with us at thehappyproject at gmail.com. We are The Happy Project. <laughs> Why are you laughing again? You're so funny. <laughs>